Well, the gray rhino is the big scary thing coming at you. Think of big, rhinos are big, uh, and the horn, the scary part. Uh, and it's standing in front of you, pawing the ground, getting ready to charge. And it's really meant as a challenge uh, to be one of the people who recognizes the gray rhino in front of them and does something about it effectively instead of being one of the people who gets trampled. And so the challenge is to take a fresh look at the obvious challenges and risks around you and to evaluate how you respond and to make sure that you're one of the people who responds effectively instead of getting trampled by the rhino. If there's a group of people who come from similar backgrounds, whether it's demographic or nationality or profession or age or anything else, then they are more likely to be vulnerable to groupthink, uh, which is what happens when you have a group of similar people around the table. One person says something and other people are more likely to repeat it, even if they feel that the first person didn't say the right uh, thing, even if they disagree. Uh, so what you want to do in groups is make sure that you have different perspectives, make sure that you encourage people to look at things from different perspectives. So the real trick in dealing with gray rhinos is to recognize that as an individual or as an organization, your innate personality, uh, your corporate culture, the processes, the habits you have, whether it's looking for more information, whether it's surrounding yourself with the right combination of people, and sometimes even if the temperature in the room or whether you had spicy food for lunch or not can change uh, your responses to things. But when you are actively aware of the kinds of biases that all humans are vulnerable to, and you put in place a structured decision-making process to help to correct for some of those biases, you're going to make better decisions and you are going to be more likely to be the one who gets out of the way of the gray rhino or uses its strength instead of just being trampled. Well, when the gray rhino came out in China in 2017, and I started going to China frequently, I'd been there twice before, uh, I was really surprised by the difference in the conversations uh, in China from the United States when it came to uh, asset bubbles and monetary policy. And I think that uh, the Chinese government made some very, very difficult but necessary decisions to try to let the air out of some of the bubbles, uh, whether it's in the uh, you know real estate or the stock market, uh, because they knew that if those bubbles kept getting bigger and bigger, when they popped, things were going to be out of control. Uh, but I think it was the right decision, uh, and I think it was a about changing people's expectations about risk. And I think that as China looks to uh, pursue a, a more sustainable form of growth going forward, uh, that is, is not just uh, dependent on debt, uh, I think that there are lots of paths going forward. Uh, and I think that there's a learning process too, you know, what works, what doesn't, uh, you know, it's very much a, you know, crossing the, crossing the river by, by feeling the stones. And we've started to see some of the economic numbers uh, improve in China. I think there are many, many challenges going forward. I think the government has recognized the need to increase uh, domestic consumption. Uh, and not rely so much on investment. And that's, uh, it's easier said than done. Uh, but I found that in China, uh, government and businesses and media are much better at asking some of the difficult questions uh, than I found in the United States. I go to China and have a, a very deep, thoughtful conversation uh, with economic policymakers, with business leaders, uh, with the media, 
And I'd come back to the States and talk about asset bubbles, and people would say, bubbles? What bubbles? Let's put some more air into these bubbles that don't exist. And so I think that the nature of the conversation, and I think you know, the awareness of uh, gray rhino risks is uh, something that I admire very much uh, about China. such a hard question because uh, when people ask me about what's the biggest gray rhino, it's uh, it, it's very different from different perspectives. Um, but I do see uh, a few things. I mean, one uh, that everyone is worried about, uh, which is sort of U.S.-China relations, uh, which have had their ups and downs over recent years. Uh, I've been happy to see that there have been efforts recently to try to smooth that out. Uh, I think it's in, an incredibly important relationship uh, between two countries that I care about a lot for uh, for all sorts of reasons. So that's one. Uh, the second is really this question of economic growth. And it's, it's not like it's any secret. That's why it's a gray rhino. It's how do you produce sustainable economic growth? How do you get the economy to grow uh, without relying too heavily on debt? And that becomes a question of, uh, of productivity, uh, of resource allocation. And when you're looking at consumption and households, uh, it's part of something that I'm doing a lot of thinking on now and that is, uh, is part of the, the work I'm doing over the next few years, which is how do you create the right risk ecosystem that encourages people to spend, particularly on domestic uh, goods and services, of course. But how do you create the sort of ecosystem that, that fairly shares both the benefits and the burdens of risk-taking uh, among uh, businesses and citizens and the role of the government in creating the right atmosphere and uh, helping to facilitate economic growth? Uh, one of the things I really love is the idea of uh, stabilization funds, which uh, you know Chile has used in Latin America with with copper and some of the other minerals. That uh, you know when prices are high, uh, a certain percentage goes into this stabilization fund, which provides a, you know a backup, a a rainy day fund, and I think that's really good. Uh, in the United States right now, we're talking about uh, banks and deposit insurance, uh, which was set for many years at a, a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, and we're now looking at how well that that worked for, you know, small, well, <laughs> quarter of a million dollars is not really small, but in some contexts it is. Uh, but I think we've looked at uh, how well that has worked and are reevaluating uh, extending that for a longer period to much larger numbers. And so I think insurance in general, in so many contexts, is a, a really amazing innovation. I think it's very positive to see uh, a, a good competition uh, among the, the United States, uh, China, European Union, other countries. I think that the more there's a competition to, to help some of these countries develop and get markets for their goods, uh, the more positive it can be, as opposed to uh, when we saw during, during the Cold War, it was more of a, a negative competition, you know, who can send more arms, and uh, it was the idea that, um, it, you know, they're competing... Uh, relationships, and I think that countries should have uh, relationships that are uh, broad and wide, uh, and uh, and 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 really, really global in scope, as well as certain special relationships that are regional. But I think that there's a uh, there's a lot of demand in China for commodities and other natural resources, which uh, Latin America has quite a lot of. Uh, and I think that there's there's still a lot of opportunity there. Uh, so, but in general, I'm I'm very much pro engagement.